أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل فلا مضل له وما يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله All praises due to Allah we seek His help and His forgiveness Whomever Allah guides, no one can misguide, and whomever Allah leaves to go astray, no one can guide. I bear witness that there is no God except Allah, and that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is his final messenger. So inshallah today we'll talk about um, Islam uh, versus atheism, or we'll talk about the proof of the existence of God. So does the universe have... Uh, a creator, which is a very important question. Nowadays, we know that atheism is spreading uh, very rapidly, and it's very important for us to understand logically um, whether there is a God or not, so that we can teach our children as well, inshallah, our future generations continue to be Muslims, proud Muslims, with evidence and with logic. So, We'll have some arguments today to prove the existence of God from a logical perspective. So the first argument is called the argument of causality. Basically, it says that everything that begins to exist has a cause. And since the universe has a beginning or it began to exist, therefore the universe has a, co um, has a cause as well. And that cause is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the reason we say the cause is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is because you cannot have unlimited causes. Let me give you an example. For example, let us say that we want to switch off the light or we want to switch on the light. And I cannot switch on the light until I take permission from my manager. And my manager cannot give me the permission until he takes permission from his manager. And so on and so forth for eternity, for, for infinity. If this is the case, and everyone keeps asking the next one, and it's an infinite number of people, we will never turn on that light, right? So this is called the uh, fallacy of uh, infinite regress. Let me give you another example. Let's say in the army, and uh, somebody is supposed to be uh, executed for being a traitor or for being a spy, something like that. So the soldier who's holding the gun cannot shoot the person until he gets orders from his commander and the commander cannot get give him the order except him when he takes the order from his commander if we keep doing that for infinity we will never shoot that person right because it will just keep going for for eternity for without any end so you have to have somebody that gives one order and then that order goes in the chain until we reach the person that we have to kill. And this answer the question, the question, um, who created God, right? Some people would say, if everything has a cause, right? So like, for example, um, I exist because my mother gave birth to me. My mother exists because her father, uh, her mother gave birth to her, etc. Right? So somebody would ask, but what about God? Who caused God or who created God, right? And the answer is simply God is uncreated. God is the cause for everything that exists. And without that explanation, we would go to the infinite regress that we explain, which is impossible and will never cause the universe to exist. So let me, let's do it with the, with the universe. Let's say uh, Allah created the universe. And if we go by their logic and they say that who created Allah, let's say another God created Allah and another God created that God, another God created that God, another God, we keep going for infinity. We will never have the universe existing in the first place. Just like the light switch would never be turned on. And that person who is supposed to be executed will never be executed. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has no beginning and has no end. He's the uh, uncreated and he's the cause for the universe. He's the uncaused cause for the universe, right? So I hope that is not confusing, inshallah. And if you have any questions, please uh, feel free to ask. So this is the first argument. Causality, which is whatever begins to exist has a cause. The universe began to exist. Therefore, it has a cause. Let me give you another very, very simple example. And subhanAllah, this goes hand in hand with logic and common sense. Let's say that you have a baby. 
And that baby, um, let's say, is uh, one month old, right? They cannot walk, they cannot get up, they cannot do anything, right? So let's say you put the baby in the crib and the mother is asleep on her own bed, right? Then you leave the room. So your baby is in the crib and the mother is asleep in her bed. You leave the room to get some food from the fridge or something. And then you come back to the room and you find your baby next to the mother on the bed, right? Does it make sense to say that this happened by chance or that there is no cause for the baby to be moved from the, uh, the crib to the mother's uh, side? Of course, it doesn't make any sense. You'd be a crazy person to think that the baby just floated in the air and went next to the mother. So something as simple as your baby moving from the crib to be next to the mother must have a cause, a cause. And, and any sane human being will say that there is a cause. Maybe the mother got up and took him and put him, put him next to her, right? But no human being will say that there is no cause for the baby to have moved from the crib and to be next to the mother. I hope that makes sense, inshallah. Uh, and we explained the idea of infinite regress. If we have infinite number of people the, and we want to turn the light on and you cannot turn it without taking permission from each one in the chain, you will never turn the light on. Therefore, the universe would never exist if we had an infinite number of people who are giving orders or how, who are uh, trying to create the universe. Argument number two. Contingency. Contingency simply means dependence. Like something is dependent upon something else. So in this universe, we can see that everything around us is dependent or possible, right? So this is used in the books of Aqidah, the books of theology, like uh, you, you find it uh, in, the, in the jargon of um, Imam Ghazali, Imam Taymiyyah, and lots of others uh, who talk about wajib al-wujud and mumkin al-wujud. So they basically divided the existence into three things. And here only I'm going to talk about two things very quick. So they divided the existence uh, uh, into three things. Something that is impossible to exist, right? I'm not going to talk about this today, but I'll just give you one quick example. Like a squared circle or like two opposites, basically. You will never have a circle that's a square at the same time. It's impossible. And the other thing, the second thing is possible existences, or these are the dependent existences, like you and me and everything that we see around us, basically. And they said the third thing is the necessary existence, which is God himself. Type. What do we mean by that? Everything around us that we observe with our own eyes, which brings us again to logic and to common sense, seems to be depending on something else. What is an example of that? A cat, for example. A cat depends on its food, like Brother Hamza would say, Brother Hamza Tortzis. Or a human is depending also on food, on oxygen, on water, etc. Without this thing that you depend on, you will not be able to exist. Without food, you will die, right? If you don't eat for like a certain number of days, you will die. If you don't drink for a certain number of days, you will die, etc. So a house, a house depends on the the foundation, for example, and uh, the, the ocean, right? If we look at the ocean, I think Imam Taymiyyah mentioned that example. Look at the ocean. If the ocean did not have a, a floor, like uh, the sea floor, right? The ocean would not exist, right? Because it is depending on that sea floor to be in the way that we see it today, right? So basically we have hundreds of thousands of things that we observe with our own eyes that are dependent on something else, right? So for their existence, they cannot exist without that thing they depend on, right? And if we kept saying, we could use the infinite regress argument again here. So we say, since everything that exists depends on something else for its existence, there must be something that is holding all of these things. There's, there must be something that is keeping all of these things in existence. And that thing has to be independent, which is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what do we mean by necessary when we're talking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? We mean that without him, nothing will exist. That's why he's very necessary for existence to be here for us to be here, for the universe to be here. Because as we said, the entire universe is dependent upon things. So 
if everything is dependent upon the other thing, etc., 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 we'll go back to the idea of infinite regress because somebody could say, hey, the universe is dependent upon another universe and that universe is dependent upon another universe, etc., for infinity, which is also absurd and brings us back to the idea of infinite regress and which will, will never happen. Eventually, all of these universes have to depend on something for their existence. Same example can be given for uh, an infinite number of humans, for example. All of them are dependent. All of them depend on food, etc. right? For them to exist, even though their number is infinite, if we pretend there is an infinite number of universes, for them to exist, they still have something that they depend on. They have to have something that they depend on. And this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So to summarize this, Argument number two, the contingency, that we have everything that we see depends on something else. The human depends on food, the, uh, the, the house depends on the foundation, or the sea depends on the sea floor. The, the tree depends on the sun, depends on the water, depends on the, um, uh, the, the fer fer fertilizers, etc. For it to continue to exist, right? So everything in the universe that we see is dependent and therefore, it cannot just exist by itself. It has something. It must have something that is independent that takes care of all of this. For example, let us say you're walking into the street. And it's also another example given by Brother Hamza. Um, and he says, imagine you're walking in the street and you see a ball that is floating, right? Will you just think that there is no reason? We'll just pass by and say, hey, yeah, that, whatever or you're going to try to find out why this ball is floating in, on, on, uh, without anything underneath it, right? You, you, you start wondering why is this ball floating like that? There must be something that it depends on. Same thing with earth. Earth looks like a ball, right? So earth, why is earth in this particular orbit? Why is it floating in space like that with this precise and um, like unique orbit that it goes through and every day, etc. right? So you ask yourself, who put that? What is the earth dependent on? And the conclusion comes to that there is a necessary being, which is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who, who is independent and who is eternal and who takes care of everything and who puts everything in its place and everything depends on him, but he depends on no one. Like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Allah samad, which means he is the one who's independent or self-sufficient. He doesn't need anyone and everyone needs him. So this is the second argument. So two arguments, causality, that everything that begins to exist has a cause. And we said like your baby, if it moves from the crib to the mother's side, you will, of course, you'll have to find a cause for it. And the second thing is contingency. Everything that exists that we can observe, that we can see is dependent upon something else. And since they are dependent, there must be something independent that is taking care of all of them or, or they depend on him and he does not depend on anyone. That takes us to uh, the idea of uh, the necessary ex existence must be one. So since everything depends on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, can Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, can that necessary existence be more than one? Can it be three, like the Christians say? Or can it be um, multiples, like the Hindus say? All right, but we'll prove now that it must be one. And this takes us to the idea of polytheism, right? Let's imagine that there are two gods, right? For the sake of argument. And we'll call God number one, God A, and the other God, God B. Now, both of them have will, right? So when it comes to the creation of the universe, let's say that God A wants to create the universe, but God B doesn't want to create the universe, right? So if God A's will happens, means he creates the universe, that means he's the true God, which means God B failed because he couldn't stop him from creating the universe. So he's not a God, right? So God B doesn't want the universe to be created, but God A was successful. So God B failed and God B is not a real God because failure is not an attribute of God. The second possibility is that God A, who wants to create the universe, will not be able to do it because God B will be able to stop him. In this case, God A is not a God. It's only one God. And the third example is impossible, that both of them will be able to do what they want, that God A will create the universe and God B will, not, will stop him, which means the universe will exist and not exist at the same time, which is impossible. 
So basically, it's impossible to have more than one independent being, being because they will limit each other or they as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَوْ كَانَ فِيهِمَا آلِهَةٌ إِلَّا اللَّهُ لَفَسَدَتَ If there was more than one God except Allah, then the universe would have been corrupted, destroyed, etc. because each one of them has his own will and he has to fulfill it, right? So we cannot say that, um, imagine, you know, like God A wants me to be tall, but God B wants me to be short, you know? Like whose will is going to happen? Also, who's going to wait for whose permission? And who is going to be stronger than who? So it's, it's impossible to have more than one God. And from logical perspective, from common sense, in our life, we never see a ship with two captains. And every, there, there is a proverb, even in English and in Arabic and so many languages, that if you have a ship with two captains, that ship will sink, right? Because they will get into a conflict. I want to go this way. No, we should go this way. I want to go at that speed. No, we should go at that speed. And then they're going to get into a fight and then it will be collapsed. Same thing, we've never seen an army with um, three generals, right? Or a, a country with two presidents or three presidents. Imagine Obama and Trump being presidents at the same time or Biden and Trump being presidents at the same time. Nothing will get done. Whatever Biden decides, uh, uh, Trump will cancel it, etc. right? So from our own logic, from our own observable reality that we see in everyday life, it's impossible to have two leaders for one thing. The same thing applies to the universe as Allah tells us in the Quran. If there was more than one God, everything would have been corrupted. Now, uh, and we talked about dependence and lack of authority because we said, let us say that there are two gods and one of them wants to do something. He, is he going to take permission from the other God? If he does, that means he doesn't have full authority. And if he does it without the permission from the other God, that means the other God doesn't matter. So I'm just going to do whatever I want without the, uh, the uh, permission from the other God. So it's always a messy situation to talk about more than one God. It's only one God and common sense and logic tells us it's one God. So this was a quick um, kind of like going out of topic to talk about why the necessary being is one and has to be one. Now that takes us to argument number three, the predisposition or the fitra. We know from the Quran and from the hadith that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created within all of humans a fitra, a predisposition, an instinct that tell them that there is a creator, that there is a God. We have the verse um, where Allah, in Surah Al-A'raf, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, وَإِذْ أَخَذَ رَبُّكَ مِنْ بَنِي آدَمَ مِنْ ذُهُورِهِمْ ذُرِيَّتَهُمْ وَأَشْهَدَهُمْ عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ أَلَسْتُ بِرَبِّكُمْ قَالُوا بَلَا شَهِدْنَا In this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that He extracted the offspring of Adam from Adam himself. When Allah created Adam, He in, uh, extracted, He took out the entire humanity that will ever live. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so this was before we came into this we, we were born by our mothers. This was before. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala extracted all of the humans from Adam alayhi salam. And he made them, all of them, you and me and everyone else, bear witness that he is our Lord. And every one of us said, shahidna ala qalu shahidna. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, uh, inna kunna an hadha ghafilin. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did that so that no one on the Day of Judgment says that we were unaware of this. Okay? And that takes us to an important thing. Like a lot of people say, I don't remember any of that, right? So I don't remember Allah. And even when it comes to the amana, the verse about the amana, Inna aradna al amana ta'ala samawati wal ardi wal jibali fa abayna yahmilnaha. When Allah created the creation, He asked, He offered the amana, the, the free will, if you will. He offered the free will to his creation, the heavens and the earth, etc., and the human, and the jinn, of course. So everyone rejected it except the humans and the jinn. So basically, we chose the free will, which comes with, uh, the free will, which comes with uh, responsibility to do good and to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to be rewarded with jannah, and the opposite if you choose the opposite. So some, some person will say, hey, but I don't remember any of that. <coughs> And the answer is simple in two, in two things. The first one is deja vu, something I'm sure you you've all have experienced deja vu, right? And it's something that you see and you, you know, or you think that this actually happened before. This exact situation happened before, but it was completely removed from my memory. 
And in some other cases, you see something that reminds you of something that was completely removed from your memory. I'll tell you an example. Um, I was once on my Facebook and I saw a suggested friend. And this person, subhanAllah, um, I met him in college for about five days, something like that. And he came to, to our house and he ate with us and he studied with us. But then he disappeared from our life. Like maybe he went to another college or something. I don't know what happened to him. But this person was completely removed from my memory for a period of about five or 10 years, something like that. And then when I saw his picture on Facebook, I was like, subhanAllah, how did that memory become completely wiped out from my head? Like, where did that person, why did he disappear from my memory? But once I saw his picture, I remembered all the details of what happened with us. And this is what's going to happen to us on the Day of Judgment. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows us something like that, we will remember that we actually said, um, that we said that we bear witness that you are our God. But let's not take this for granted. If, if, uh, if an atheist is talking to you or if somebody's questioning this, tell them, hey, even though Allah did all of that, I'll give you empirical evidence. And also Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not going to hold us accountable just based on that fitrah, right? Out of his mercy, he didn't want us to just, you know, uh, be judged by this fitrah. He actually sent us messengers and he sent us books and he sent us evidence. And he even said, those who did not get a messenger in this life, I'm going to give them a messenger in the hereafter. I'm going to test them in the hereafter so that they do not have any excuses. But what is the, what am I talking about by the empirical evidence for the existence of the fitrah? A study was conducted in 2011 in Oxford University. And this was a huge study, multi-million uh, English pounds uh, study. And it was conducted in different countries. So samples from different countries, not just from America or England, etc. And the study was done on children to try to find out whether there is something, there is a predisposition within the children that the human is born with that get them the feeling that there is a creator to this universe, that there is a God. And the study's results showed that there is actually this thing that the, the, the human is born with something that brings him, that makes him think that there is a creator, that makes him think or believe or feel that there is a creator. And there's another study that I read about that was done only on atheists. And inshallah, I'm planning, inshallah, I have an idea for a study to conduct. Hopefully, inshallah, I will be able to do it. Um, it just needs like resources and things like that. But anyways, the studies that was conducted on the atheists, it found that 35% of them said, and you know, studies like this have limitations because you never know if the person is telling the truth, etc. So 35% of them said that um, they feel there is a here, hereafter. They feel there is a being out there that is the, the maker of this universe or that is controlling the universe. So even the atheists who deny the existence of God or who deny um, religions, all of them, they still have this fitra within them that tell them that there is a God, that there is a creator, that there is a sustainer. So this, and even subhanAllah, people when they get into big trouble or in a big uh, problem, they usually, even if they don't believe in God, they, they feel that there is a need, I'm going to ask God or I'm going to save my God or I'm going to look up or, you know, there is this feeling within us that gives us the idea that there is a God. So the fitra is the argument number three. And as we said, the Oxford University made it, um, made that empirical study on it. And the next part is the gap. This is something that I always think about and um, I'm trying to find answers for it, like uh, convincing answers. I found some answers from some researchers, but they are not convincing at all. What I mean by the gap is the gap between the humans and all other species. There are billions of species on this planet and not a single one of them can come near the humans in their uh, intellect, understanding and development. And, you know, have you ever seen a, a monkey, a group of monkeys building a factory or working on making a laptop or working on making an airplane or working on making a rocket or a spaceship or a school? And, uh, you know, have you ever seen any other creation, any other species that comes near the humans with the 
the amount and subhanallah if you look at natural selection we'll talk about inshallah um, evolution soon if you look at natural selection and how the adaptation and all these things that the the the, the area where you are the place where you are is what kind of like helps you acquire the new features or the new um things that can make you a different species etc humans existed side by side with billions of other species for a long time how come the humans are the only ones that have this intellect that have the ability to build these rockets and airspace and uh, air uh, spaceships etc but no other have you ever seen a group of monkeys talking about you know um having a debate on religion or having a debate on god or having no, it's only the humans. So why is this such a huge gap if they existed in the same context? And the theory of evolution says that it's the things, the surrounding things that cause you to be. This. So as I said, I saw some researchers talking about why there's such a gap, but their answers are not convincing at all. And the next thing also takes us to the fitrah. And subhanAllah, so the, this gap I'm talking about is because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي آدَمَ that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala dignified the children of Adam and he gave them this dignity or he gave them this preference over all of the other creation that he created. So Allah is telling us there is a gap because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made us better than... Um, Yes, yeah, subhanAllah, Brother Shah said a very good thing. It's irony, however, humans are the only creation that denies the existence of Allah. Very ironic, yeah, mashallah. So even though Allah gave the human, the, only the humans this amazing intellect, but they are the only of the life. Yeah, very good. So the training example, so Allah mentioned this gap in the Quran that he gave the children of Adam this preference over all other creation. The, the train example was given by a brother uh, called Muhammad Hijab. Um, he said, if you are, let us say that you fall asleep and then you wake up and you find yourself on a train that's going at 60 or 80 miles per, per hour. What will the, be the first question that you ask? And this also takes us to the question that sister, um, um, forgot her name. One of the sisters asked, can we have religion without uh, sorry, can we be good without religion? Can we just be good without Allah? It's so true that somebody's asking these questions. And the answer is from the predisposition, from the fitrah. As a human being, if you were to be asleep and then you wake up, you find yourself on a train that is going by uh, on a speed of 60 or 80 miles per hour. You're not just going to, you know, I'm just going to live on that train and forget about it. I'm not going to think about anything. I just want to be happy. No, you're going to think and ask, why am I here? And where is the train going, right? So subhanAllah, like this is something within ourselves. Every human being, if you were to do that experiment with them and put them on a train, right? And they, they wake up, they find themselves on a train. They have to ask these two questions. And this is because of our fitrah, right? If, if we were just some random chance or something, if we were to wake up on the train, hey, I don't care. I'm just going to continue uh, on the train and just try to be happy. No, every human being, because... Of that fitrah in them, they would ask, why am I here on that train and where am I going? So this is the fitrah that tells you that why are you here on this planet? What is the purpose of your life and where are you going? What is what is the hereafter? That's why we said in the studies, even the atheists feel that there is some sort of hereafter. So I hope inshallah that this argument of fitrah is clear. Bismillah. So now we move to argument number four. <clears throat> which is the argument of the fine tuning of the universe. Fine tuning means that the universe is constructed in such a way that it allows the existence of life. If it was any other way, it like for example the you know the universe uh, the um, the theory of the expanding universe. If the universe was expanding at a different speed like some some people even say um, less than a second that life wouldn't exist. In, in the way it is right now. So the fine tuning tells us that the universe was, was constructed or was built or is designed in a certain way that would allow the existence of life. In addition to that, add to that the, the idea of the designer, right? So for example, the phone, I use that example a lot with uh, atheists. I tell them this phone I have has uh, two possibilities for, for it to be here. Either it had a maker 
or just popped into existence out of nothing? And the answer they say, uh, it, it has a maker. I tell them, have you seen the person who made the iPhone? They say, no, we did not see him. I say, but you believe that somebody made it because of its complex design, something like that having to put all these chips and little silicon and and the screen and the camera and all these things putting them together cannot just be the product of chance or cannot just come out of nothing there must be a person who made it and they say yes but now they have always they always have this question and or counter argument and they say but i can go to the factory and i see the iphone being made but i cannot do that with the universe right so the answer to that is there are things they believe in and there's no way for them they believe that somebody made but there's no way for them to see it being made in a factory take the example of the pyramids we know the pyramids uh, have all these complexities and intricate things that until today we're still discovering things about the pyramids about the 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 the, the things that are happening within inside and all of these things so the, I asked them, do you believe that the pyramids were made by somebody or they just popped out of nothing? They say, we believe they were made out of some, by somebody. But can you go to a factory and see the pyramids being made? And they say, no, right? So subhanAllah, this is also logic, common sense. You see something very complex in its design. It's impossible for it to just pop out of nothing into existence. And if we look at the iPhone and we say, hey, the iPhone is complex, therefore it must have a maker or a designer. Then look at the human body. What is more complex in its design? The human body or the iPhone? Of course, the human body. Therefore, the human body also must have a designer. The same thing applies to planet Earth, which is more complex, and then the universe, which is also more complex. So I hope this argument is clear as well. Now, <clears throat> let's look at what the possibilities of the universe coming to existence are, based on what we just said. So, number one, it comes out of nothing. <coughs> that it popped out of nothing and we said this is impossible you never see an iphone popping out of nothing so empirical evidence observable evidence tells us that something that is complex in its design will never just pop into existence out of nothing and let's watch this video together let's see how people reacted to this atheist famous atheist who's claiming that something can come out of nothing right because it really goes against common sense Is my video lagging or anything, or you you can hear me fine? It's good. Yeah. Okay. Alhamdulillah. All right. Let's let's look at this man, Richard Dawkins. I'm sure you've heard of him. So he's trying to say that something can come out of nothing, and look at how people reacted, like normal people, Subhanallah. Even non Muslims. week. Now, it is very mysterious how the universe came into being. It's a deeply mysterious and interesting question. And, and can I just interrupt? It's an old question, a very old question. Thomas Aquinas in the 13th century was asking the same question. He said there must have been a time when no physical things existed. But something can't come from nothing. That was his view. It was well, preceded by us. Something era. can come from nothing, and that's what physicists are now, are now telling us. Um, I could give you, you asked me to give you a, a layman's interpretation. It would be a very, very layman's interpretation. Um, when you have um, matter and antimatter and you put them together, um, they cancel each other out and give rise to, to nothing. What Lawrence Krauss is now suggesting is that if you start with nothing, the process can go into reverse and produce matter and antimatter. The theory is still being worked out. Well, there are many troubles with Richard's uh, teachings, but a, a fundamental one is that he dumbs down God and he soups up nothing. Richard dispute exactly what, what's meant by, by nothing, but whatever it is, it's very, very simple. And he, why is that funny? <laughs> Well, I think it's a bit funny to be trying to define nothing. <laughs> okay. So people were laughing at him for trying to say or define nothing, right? 
or he, he's basically trying to argue that something can come out of nothing. And it ended up of him being looking like a fool and people making fun of him and laughing at him, right? Because just, just simple logic, like a child in kindergarten will agree that nothing can come out of nothing, right? You can never have something from nothing. So the first argument here that the universe, uh, the probability of the universe coming out of nothing is impossible, of course. Let me try to... Uh, why is this not working? Okay, anyway, so the first possibility is that the universe will come out of nothing, which is impossible. Wait, let me fix it so that we can all, inshallah, benefit from the presentation here. Okay, I fixed it. Okay, so out of nothing, impossible. And it created itself, right? Some, someone might say the universe created itself, but this is as absurd as saying that your mother gave birth to herself, just like Brother Hamza also say, or that the iPhone made itself, right? It's impossible, logically impossible. Or that the universe always existed, meaning it does not have a beginning, but this goes against a scientific uh, fact. The, 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 all scientists agree today that the universe has a beginning. And, and even if you say the universe always existed, but this is in Islam, this is kufr, of course, because you would say that the universe has no beginning, therefore it's as old as God himself, right? But even if we say the universe always existed, for the sake of argument, you still have the problem of dependency that we talked about. The universe depends on something, right? The universe, if, as we say, if you see a hovering ball, Right? There must be something that is making it hover. It just cannot hover by itself like that because it's a dependent thing. The universe is also dependent. Therefore, there must be something that keeps it in its place, that keeps it in the way it is, etc. But as we said, the universe has a beginning and scientists already agree on that. And number four, that the universe evolved, the universe evolved, but also there is no evidence for that. And as we said, also the, the problem of dependency will still be there. What does it depend on, right? And number five, that it came by chance, the universe came by chance, but this is also as absurd as saying um, a tornado or a, nuclear, or a bomb explodes in a junkyard, you know, a junkyard full of pieces of metal, etc. And then this explosion or this tornado ends up assembling the, the pieces of metal together in order to create a beautiful airplane 747 that is ready to fly with all the technology, the engine, the fuel, the, the wiring, the electricity, the bathrooms and everything in it, just because of an explosion or a tornado going into that junkyard. So it doesn't make any sense. It's illogical as well. So we are left with one possible explanation. And this is the only explanation which makes perfect sense, which makes, um, which goes hand in hand with our logic and which goes hand in hand with all the arguments that we introduced in the beginning, that the universe was created. So now the question that the sister asked, can I just be good without religion? And the answer is that we're going to be going against the fitra. Like we said that there is a purpose. If you wake up on a train, you need to know why you're here and where you're going. So you will be going against your fitra, which will cause you a lot of problems in your life. It could be psychological problems, etc. And number two, objective morality. This is a big issue. I'll just quickly try to touch on it. Objective morality doesn't exist. Basically, we can, humans cannot agree on what is good and what is bad, right? For example, here in America, the, a lot of people say alcohol is good for you and they love to drink it, etc. But in the Middle East, in the Muslim world, you find people saying alcohol is very bad for you, do not drink it, etc. When it comes to incest, you have, uh, I've seen with my own eyes, a debate between a Muslim and an atheist, and the Muslim asked the atheist about, you know, a relationship with the mom, like a, a marriage to the mom, a, a son and a mom, and he, he said, it is not clear to me that it is wrong, right? Homosexuality, rape, the person who's committing the rape, they're actually enjoying it, they think it's good, and, and you have lots of other examples where people might think something is bad, but others think that the same thing is wrong, right? 
like bullfighting, for example, in Spain. They, they enjoy it and they're doing it every year. But from our Islamic perspective, this is a terrible thing. This is haram. This is awful that you should not be hurting these animals in this, in this way. And they're still happening until today, subhanAllah, in this, in this day and age. So since we do not know if, if humans come together to agree on what is good and what is bad, we will never come to an agreement. We need somebody who is the most knowledgeable, the most knowing to tell us what is really right and what is really wrong for us, what will make our life better and what will make our life worse. And this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, just like a machine, a person who builds a laptop or who builds uh, any, any complicated machine, they make a manual for it, right? And in order to get to know everything about this machine, the best way for you is to go to the manual, right? Especially if you want to fix something with it, if there's a problem with it, or the best way to use this machine and to make it live for as long as possible is to look at the manual. And this manual for us humans is the Quran that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to us, right? So this objective morality tells you since it doesn't exist everybody's going to be subjective about what they think is right and wrong then you need that manual which is the quran from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to tell you what is the good thing for you and what is the bad thing for you and the third question you ask yourself is uh, ask that person who's saying can i just be good without religion is why do we have laws right if if it was possible for all people to be just good without any religion or anything then you wouldn't find laws and government or like police etc and number four, the hereafter, as we said, the person who just wants to live without religion, they, they are going to struggle in the hereafter, especially that Allah gave you all these arguments, puts within you the fitrah to know him, etc. Then you will have nothing for you in the hereafter. And in fact, you might be going to Jahannam. Billah. And number five, understanding our purpose. We talked about that. <coughs> And the satisfaction, the feeling that I am here fulfilling my purpose, doing my duty, doing what I was created to do. This gives you a sense of satisfaction, a sense of happiness, a sense of peace to prevent you from falling into psychological problems or stress or worry, etc. Now, Islam and evolution, and inshallah, I'm almost done. Uh, so there are two things that Islam rejects and uh, accepts in evolution, and these are adaptation and speci speciation. And adaptation and speciation, I'll give you quick examples, like adaptation um, is like the teeth of the horse, for example, that it was changed in a certain way in order to, um, because of the things that they eat. Speciation, uh, they give the example of the finches, a kind of bird that had a kind of peak, but because of a certain surroundings it ended up having a different peak so they are still the same thing they're still a bird so the finches are still birds the horses are still horses but the adaptation and speciation is just a change happening to part of their their body now what do we reject with evolution is that humans evolved from the cousins of monkeys or whatever or from monkeys themselves uh, we reject that because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that he created Adam with his hands in addition to that, it's still a theory, it's not a fact. There is no observable evidence that shows us a change of kind. There's a video I would show you, maybe I'll send it inshallah on the group, because we don't have much time. A person asking so many biologists, etc., people with PhD, show me one example of observable change of kind, right? For like from one species, from one animal to another, or like from monkey to something, something that we can see with our own, and none of them were able to give. Uh, an example of that, right? Because it happens over, according to them, over billions of years. So we do not have any observable evidence that there is a change of kind happening in our world. So Islam rejects that humans evolved from anything else. Allah created Adam with his own hands. We also reject the idea of randomness, like random mutation, etc. Because Allah says in the Quran, Inna kulla shayin khalaqnahu bi qadar. There is nothing random in the word. Everything that happens is happening because of the qadr of Allah, because of the predestination of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And of course, on a moral level, we reject survival of the fittest. And this is day two video, but I'll send it inshallah in the group because we don't have time. So overall, it's a theory that might be proven wrong in the future, right? And, uh, you know, science changes a lot. There were people who for thousands of years, for hundreds of years, believed that the earth was flat. But then science came uh, with advances and told them, no, it's not flat. There, there was the Newtonian um, uh, example of gravity, that gravity is a pulling force. But then came the uh, Einstein's 
uh, mo model of gravity, which is that it's a pushing force, not a pulling force. So it's rejecting Newton. So science changes. And I, I have a lot of, I've been watching a lot of people, PhDs, etc., who are starting to speak against evolution and saying that it's m kind of more politicized. Like I would lose my job if I don't say that evolution is a fact. Now, the last thing is falsification. Allah subhanahu and you know, in science, in order to, to prove something, you know, it must have a falsification process. Like let's say I made a study, I brought some participants and I proved that the humans are born with a device in their head that enables them to speak, for example, or to have language or to acquire language. And then another person does a study and brings like double the number of people in their study to show that I'm wrong, right? So this is called the falsification process. It's used a lot in science. So in the Quran, we have this falsification profit, uh, process. If you want to prove that the Quran is not from Allah, the burden is on you here. Allah gave you some challenges. Number one, create a fly. Mention in Surah Al-Hajj. Number two, produce a book like the Quran. Mention in Surah Hud and other surahs. Number three, change the Quran. Surah Al-Hajj. Number four, find a contradiction in the Quran. Right? So all of these are challenges that have never been met until today. And if you want to prove the Quran is wrong, the Quran is not from Allah, then you have to do the falsification process, the scientific falsification process, and prove Allah wrong in these four things. So the summary, we have provided six arguments to the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, causality, that everything has a cause, everything that begins to exist, contingency, everything depends on something else, and we must have one independent thing that everything else depends on, and fitrah that was uh, created within us to know Allah, to find Allah, to look for Him, and fine-tuning the design argument and morality and falsification. So I hope inshallah that this uh, gives you enough evidence to know and subhanAllah like if we have this much evidence for any scientific thing people will believe in it without even having a shred of doubt. Like if you have this much number of empirical evidence etc for all the things that we mentioned in a scientific thing not in a religious thing people will just accept it without any shred of doubt but because it's about Allah they tend to just reject it out of you know whatever they have in their in their mind so i hope inshallah this helps i hope inshallah that you can uh, learn this and teach it to your children and it's very important in this day and age that our children understand all of these arguments so that they are when they are faced with the problem of atheism they can uh, defend themselves and they can also feel proud to be muslim for having this understanding and this beautiful logic and common sense jazakumullah khairan sorry i went over time and I'll put it, inshallah on YouTube for others to watch it. So, um, can I make uh, one point? Yes, absolutely. You know, I think it's also important to note how Allah deals with the subject in the Quran. You, you know, the concept of one supreme being in the Quran, God gives very simple examples, right? He says, right. look, look at creation, look at the sky, the sun, the moon, the mountains, all of the animals. Absolutely. How else could this have come into being? Right. So, you know, we, we talk... We're in 2021 and we talk about these detailed scientific theories and experiments, and, but you don't need higher education or a right. PhD, right? You just need to use your logic, your brain. Absolutely. And if you do, Allah mentioned, he says it himself. It is very obvious and it's very clear. And that ability to think, that's not something special or unique. Everyone has that. It, it can't be that Allah's given some people the ability to think and others not, right? Everyone has this ability, but the disbelievers for one reason or another, they bury this obvious fact. Right. And eventually it becomes as obvious as it is to us, right? We look at the, the tree and we're like, how else could this have, have come into being? It's impossible for them to see. And, and it's of their own doing that they have buried all of these obvious things. And just one real quick thing, the clip you showed on Richard Dawkins' aside, which he really looked foolish. Mm -hmm. If you study these scientific theories and these professors, the, these very famous atheists, they all concede, all of them, other than this clip, mm -hmm. uh, which I've never seen before, but it, it really, he really sounds silly. Mm -hmm. They all concede that the initial cause cannot be explained. Right. And if you don't have an initial cause, all of your theories fall flat. Absolutely. And they run around and they use these funny little words and devices, but 
ultimately not one of them can tell you where did it all start. Right. Absolutely. And, and subhanAllah, like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, like all the arguments I mentioned today, like you'll find origin for them in the Quran. Like I'm khuliqu min ghari shayin, I'm hum khaliqu. Allah is asking the question, were they created from nothing? Are they the creators of themselves? Like, can you create yeah. yourself? Can your mother give birth to herself, like the brother um, mentioned? So it's it's just very obvious, but they have other reasons that for, for their rejection. They just have completely different reasons. It's, it's, as we said, like, it's clear to anyone. And, you know, a lot of it is um, arrogance. Just yeah. when, you, when you hear these people talk, you know, like he's throwing words out that are contradicting, but he, you know, he talks in an English accent and everyone gets all excited. You can talk in an English accent and still be an idiot, trust me. Right, it's and charisma. You can make nonsensical arguments like he did. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But, but, but it is rooted in arrogance, unfortunately. That, that's right. ultimately where it comes down to. Yeah, subhan- and even subhan- not just like, yeah, yeah, any simple things that the, a student in like middle school will know like in his book for example there's the the book he wrote the god delusion which is like the it was a best-selling etc I, I looked at one of the arguments he's saying the argument like who created god like this argument a student in middle school can can answer how could you be on that level of popularity and you know uh, and and then bring such a silly argument we believe god is uncreated so do not even bring the question of who created god in the in this question and then it takes you to the infinite regress which is also another absurdity it's just subhanallah alhamdulillah like i feel like it's it, we just need education we just need to teach people like people in need of understanding these arguments right so that they do not follow the charisma because right now as you said like what they're saying is not making any sense, but it's the English accent, the charisma, and all of these things that is attracting people, right? In addition to, to having things in their life, like maybe they were abused when they're children, maybe what happened to them in church, maybe something like that, you know? Or it drives them, I'm talking about America, not about um, uh, Muslim country. So it drives them to find, hey, this guy is charismatic. He's saying things that agree with what I'm feeling right now, not with common sense, but with what I'm feeling. So I'm just gonna follow this man. Um, and subhanAllah, may Allah guide them. And it's just our job to kind of like show a better image and show the clear examples of the clear arguments that prove the existence of God. May Allah guide us all. I mean, okay, brother, Jazakallah khairan for your interactions and your comments. Very nice. And uh, I'll see you inshallah next week. Okay, thanks, man. Wa alaikum